Okay, welcome everyone to the ISD Experimental Lake Series season launch. This has become a bit of an annual affair and we're really, really excited to have so many people with us today. I hope we have a bit of a fun program. I hope you enjoy it. I hope you learn something about what we're doing out at the Experimental Lakes area and really around the world. Um, we've got people on the call from Dryden, Sioux Lookout, Winnipeg, sunny St. Boniface, um, uh, Scotland, uh, New York. It's, it's fantastic. It's so nice to see all the friendly faces and alumni and people that have been out to the field station and people who care about fresh water. So thanks so much for joining us. Um, I'm Pauline, I'm Deputy Director of the Experimental Lakes Area, and I'm going to be your host for today. Uh, so I want to extend a huge welcome on behalf of all of our family, friends, and fish at the Experimental Lakes Area, the world's freshwater laboratory. I want to start by acknowledging that our Winnipeg headquarters are located in Treaty 1 territory, the traditional land of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene people, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. The IXD Experimental Lakes Area Field Station, where I think we've got people joining today from Hungry Hall, is in the traditional land of the Anishinaabe Nation in Treaty 3 territory and the homeland of the Métis Nation. If you're joining from somewhere differently than us today, we would encourage you to find out whose land you're on and take a moment to acknowledge it. I'll just begin with some small housekeeping points. Before we launch into our contest for today, we welcome anyone who feels comfortable to turn their camera on. Um, particularly at the end, it would be nice to see everybody's uh, smiling faces, but there's no pressure to do so. Those of you who are in your pajamas, you can just keep that to yourself. If you need closed, closed captioning, you can turn them on by clicking on the button at the bottom of your screen labeled CC. If at any point you notice a weak connection, we, we recommend that you turn off your camera and microphone. Sometimes this helps uh, your computer process the call more easily. If you have any other questions about how to use Zoom, feel free to message me in the chat for assistance. Um, and we will just bring to your attention that we're, we are recording this event so that those who cannot make it can still participate. If during today's celebration, you have any comments or questions that you wanna pose, be sure to pop them in the chat. We'll try to have some time at the end to answer them. We also would love to hear where you're joining from and many people have done that already. If you haven't, let us know. Um, also many notes from the field include a favorite food or drink from the people that are giving them. And so if you wanna tell us about what you're eating or drinking today, we would love to hear that too. We are so thrilled to be back with a bang in 2022. So thrilled, in fact, that we have been doing the Limno dance in this image for the past number of weeks. And shout out to everyone who's been hauling sandbags and building sandbags to make these Limno crowds possible. We have over 50 people on site at the moment, new research projects kicking off, mesocosms being built, samples being taken. The site is bustling with returning friends, new students, and there is definitely a buzz in the air. While we are still taking serious precautions when it comes to COVID-19, we are now looking at our busiest and biggest field research season since 2019. And that brings us to our theme for today's celebration, notes from the field. When our scientists are out in the field doing research, it's common practice to take notes on ev everything from the weather that day to details about their methodology. Today, several ISD ELA researchers and associates have been kind enough to make digital notes explaining what they'll be up to this research season. And of course, because we are the world's freshwater laboratory, our field is the whole world. So you will be hearing from partners, students, and friends from Pinawa to Algeria. So let's start with the aforementioned Pinawa. We're going to try something new, and I hope it works. Uh, we're going to try and connect with Emily and Savannah from our education outreach team who are at an event in Pinawa right now, celebrating the launch of a new project that's supported by RBC Tech for Nature uh, to monitor the health of the Winnipeg River system in real time. Let's see if we can, can we connect to them? Yeah. Hello. Yay. <laughs> hey, this is Emily and Savannah. We're live in Pinawa today at the Aquatic Life launch. I'm going to show you, we have our beautiful ELA table set up here. So we have some vials here to show everyone in Pinawa some specimens. Uh, we have our brand new food web Jenga activity uh, that passersby can play. And we've got a really awesome turnout today. Uh, you can see there's lots of people. 
Uh, we do have a little bit of barbecue set up for everyone who's come today. And then this afternoon, we're gonna continue uh, by stopping by school. So do you oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so we're gonna stop by the school and do uh, two presentations for grade four, five, and five, six classes. And uh, yeah, they'll get to learn a little bit about the watersheds and what we do at ELA. Yeah, nice we're so you guys. What, just tell me, did it rain? We were watching the forecast. No, not yet. It kind of clouded over a little bit, so it might rain this afternoon, but um, yeah. It's it been hot okay. and sunny so far. That's fantastic. Thanks so much. And big shout out to our partner on this project, Aquatic Life Limited, who've put a ton of work into this event as well. So I'm so happy it was a success. Thanks for joining you guys. Have a great afternoon. Good luck with the schools. Bye. Okay, I'm just getting the presentation back up. Okay, now let's say a yeehaw and a howdy you all to some researchers down in Texas who are headed up north to discover what happens to a whole ecosystem when tires from cars break down and leach into local water systems. Yep, you heard that right. Let's hear from the Nielsen Lab down at the University of Texas in Austin. Hey hey y'all! Congratulations IISD ELA on your 54th summer season. We're the Nielsen Lab and this is our note from the field. We're the Nielsen Lab from the University of Texas at Austin Marine Science Institute and we're headed up to ELA this summer to study the effects of tire wheel particles on ecosystems. We're coming from southern Texas and we're looking forward to kicking back and relaxing with some good old Texas sweet tea. We're looking forward to seeing y'all this summer and can't wait to get our season started. <laughs> that is so awesome. I can't wait to meet the three of you guys. On a personal note, when I was a student at ELA in the 90s, there was, hey, hey, <laughs> there was an amazing team from Texas and Arizona uh, that were doing research on stoichiometry. And they were, I still remember them as being some of the most funny people I've ever met in my life. So I am very, very happy to have some Texans coming back to ELA in 2022. Next up, we have a team working on a wild rice study. Wild rice is a pretty popular in Manitoba and across Northwestern Ontario. And here at the Experimental Lakes area this year, we wanna discover if you can safely fertilize wild rice patties with water from aquaculture. We're trying to look at full cycle management of these kinds of systems. But the team leading that project can explain it way better than I can. So let's hear from them. Hello, congratulations IISD on your 54th summer season. My name is Lisa Peters and I'm a research associate in non-invasive assessments. And this is my note from the field. Today, we are at the University of Manitoba's mesocosm site. And I'm really excited to tell you about a new project that we've started with a local indigenous company called Myera. Basically, we are looking for the best ways to fertilize wild rice using uh, waste from aquaculture production operations. And we want to make sure that we don't add excess nutrients that will cause algal blooms. And we are doing this to help develop economic opportunities for indigenous communities. And with me today are three graduate students that are going to be working on this project. And they would like to tell you a little bit about what they're going to do. Okay. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Nick, uh, and like Lisa said, I'm a master's student on this project. Um, my project is focused on the wa water quality alterations that can arise when we add uh, nutrients into the wild rice systems. Uh, and I'm also going to be looking at the uh, responses of the plant itself in terms of uh, growth and nutrient uptake to assess their ability to remediate and, and recycle uh, nutrients. Hi, I'm Leah. I'm the other master's student on this project and I'm looking specifically at invertebrates within all the tubs. And one of the methods we're using is environmental DNA. So that's using different, looking at the different DNA fragments um, to just assess the overall invertebrate ecosystem health. Hi everyone, I'm Krista. I'm another graduate student on the project. Uh, my project is assessing fish health using gene fragments found in their mucus. It's a really great minimally invasive way to assess fish's health. And today we actually added our fish into the tubs here 
at the uh, University of Manitoba. So after a long day in the field, we like to get together and have a drink and some snacks. And my drink of choice would be a Rattler. Um, I like to have my favorite blueberry beer from a local brewery here in Winnipeg. I always go for a Caesar with pickle juice. <laughs> <laughs> it's How about you, Nick? <laughs> Uh, I'll, uh, I always opt for a nice, cold, light beer. <laughs> and, and working with this crew, I usually favor tequila. <laughs> I can't wait to have Hello. one of those drinks myself at the end of the day. Um, so we've said it before, and we will say it again. We simply could not do any of this without you. None of this cutting edge research or threats to fresh water that we conduct. None of the burgeoning scientists we invite to the site to build their careers. None of the critical equipment to buy, we buy to make sure the world's freshwater laboratory runs smoothly would be possible without our donors. I want to extend a huge thank you to all of the donors. Some of you who are here today, um, we couldn't really do any of this without you. Uh, just recently, you helped raise over $60,000 to buy critical equipment for our chemistry lab. Let's hear from Sonia, our research chemist, who shows us how easy it was to construct. Mantech's well-written instructions makes installing the MT100 a snap. Thank you to all of our donors for helping us build up our labs. I love that video so much. Sonia just looks so awesome. She's so happy to have that new equipment. Really appreciate it. Um, as I said before, we're excited to be revving up our research at the World's Freshwater Laboratory this year with some new research, more visitors, and a flooded road, which wasn't that exciting. Um, it was exciting, but not that great. Uh, with some images from the field to inspire him, uh, we're going to call upon Vince Pallas, our head research scientist, to show us what our 54th summer season has in store for us. Now, we are totally putting Vince on the spot here. We've got a series of images that he's going to speak to. Um, he's going to spend a couple of uh, or minutes per image and tell us about what the 2022 research season has in store. Thanks, Pauline. Uh, hello. Uh, as Pauline said, my name is Vince Pallas. I'm the head scientist at the IASD Experimental Lakes area. Uh, what you're seeing here is a drone picture of a portion of the 30 kilometer long road that connects our field station to the Trans-Canada Highway. So just about 60 kilometers east of Kenora, you make a hard right uh, and you go down this gravel road. Um, throughout the field season, but particularly in the spring, we haul supplies up and down this road for our many experiments. Usually they, they're preceded by a construction phase. So this road is pretty well traveled and it's pretty well traveled during the season as well. But this year, uh, especially, we had a lot of projects on the go. So this road was going to be uh, especially busy, except, can you flip to the next slide, please, Pauline? With all of the snow melt and the rainfall that we got in the spring, we had a huge issue with our road. So this is one of the washouts that we had to contend with. Um, and you can see that that is, uh, even for the most uh, capable four-wheel drives, not traversable. But Scientists, graduate students, and our operations staff can be pretty stubborn and persistent, as you see here. Uh, so they found a way to get needed supplies and people in and sometimes even out until the water subsided. Uh, subsided enough so that we could uh, fix the road and restore connectivity so that the science could go on. Uh, next slide, please. So you've already heard from the University of Texas folks who are studying the effects of tire particles. This project is sort of like one of those detective whodunit stories. And it started with observations of fish kills on the West Coast um, after uh, rain events and runoff uh, from roadways. Uh, and then it was discovered that a chemical found in small tire particles called, and the chemical is called 6-PPD, um, and it's added to tires to prevent their weathering. Uh, and that might be the culprit for some of these fish kills. So when those tire particles are exposed to air and UV light, that chemical, the 6-PPD, becomes 6-PPD quinone. And this is a damaging compound that can cause toxicity to many different uh, aquatic organisms, including fish. And so our team, in collaboration with those University of Texas folks that you saw, uh, designed a study to examine not just the concentrations that might kill fish, but those that might cause more subtle effects at, at lower concentrations. So all of this took place, and, and I'm pretty amazed by this, all of this took place just one year after that chemical was first identified. So we're really working on a very current topical issue here. 
And I just wanted to point out too, that we're not, uh, we're doing this work in small enclosures. So we're not adding it to an entire lake. Uh, we wanna protect our lakes, obviously. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and similarly, uh, those enclosures that I talked about uh, that we're using for the 6-PPD quinone study, we've used a lot of times for many different studies. So for example, since 2017, we've been using enclosures like the one shown in this picture to study the potential effects of oil spills on shorelines and also the best way to clean them up. So oftentimes uh, the way oil spills are cleaned up is quite damaging. It's very uh, intrusive. There's a lot of dredging, removal of material. But the FOREST project, and that stands for Freshwater Oil Spill Remediation Study, is looking at how bacteria respond to the presence of oil and whether or not we can stimulate those bacteria to speed up their consumption of oil and remove it from uh, oil spill sites. So one of the techniques that we're using is actually pairing those bacteria, partnering them with plants on floating mats of vegetation. And the idea is that the plants provide the bacteria with oxygen and nutrients and cofactors and, and, and to the bacteria that live on their root systems. And then the bacteria, of course, return the favor by degrading that oil so that it's not uh, exposing the plants to it. Uh, next slide, please. So in addition to the project work that we do, and when I talk about project work, it means experiments like the 6-PPD quinone and the and oil spill studies. Uh, one of the cornerstones of IASDELA is our Long-Term Ecological Research Program or LTR program. So we've been collecting biological and chemical data from our field station and our lakes for 54 years now. And this is work that helps us to keep track of things like climate change and how the lakes respond to changes. Um, for, for example, we've seen that the number of ice-free days on our lakes has decreased. And of course, this has an impact on the food web and even in the fish in our lakes. And now, as we move forward uh, into our 54th season, we're excited to include new technologies into our arsenal for LTR monitoring. So things like using drone imagery and satellite imagery that I showed you earlier, and data loggers that help us to collect that data more frequently and to actually extend the application of our models, so the lakes that we study, to use that data to extrapolate what might happen in other areas of the world as well. Uh, next slide, please. One of the two new techniques that we're using, and you heard a little bit about this earlier on from the wild rice crew, is, uh, is called environmental DNA or eDNA for short. eDNA is genetic material that gets into the environment either from mucus or feces or lost skin cells, dead animals. Anytime an animal is in an environment, it will release some of its genetic material. And the amazing genetic techniques that we have available to us now allow us to sequence those fragments of eDNA so that we can figure out which animals live in that environment. So all we need is a water sample and we can tell what types of fish live in that lake without ever having to catch them or even to see them. So our scientists are applying these techniques to study how fish use different habitats, how their use of those habitat changes with things like climate change, or even how contaminants can affect fish and not just fish, but insects in our lakes. Next slide, please. Finally, I wanted to give a big shout out to one of the biggest projects that's underway at ELA last year and again this year. And this is one that addresses a very important issue for Canada and the world, and that is how is plastic waste affecting our ecosystems? So the plastics project is headed by Dr. Chelsea Rockman from the University of Toronto, uh, Dr. Diane Orahel from Queen's University, and Dr. Mike Rennie from Lakehead University. And of course, some of our own scientists are involved in this as well, ISD's own uh, Michael Patterson, Scott Higgins, Sonia Havens, and many others from Canada and the United States. So the plastics project is looking at how three different types of microplastics, so microplastics smaller than five millimeters in size, how the presence of those plastics can affect lake ecosystems. And again, we're using enclosures here to study the fate of the microplastic particles uh, and their additives, so things that are added to uh, plastics uh, to increase their resistance to UV breakdown, how that has an effect at various levels of the food web. So that's just a brief snapshot of what's going on uh, out of DLA this year. There are many other projects, uh, but I'll pass it back to Pauline now. Thanks so much, Vince. That's fantastic. So just a reminder to everyone, if you have any questions or you think of questions over the next half of this event, uh, just type them in the chat and we'll see if we can put Vince further on the spot uh, at the end of the session. Um, 
I think I want to hear just a little bit more about what we're trying to discover about plastics and what they do to freshwater. Huge shout out to Chelsea Rockman, like Vince said, um, and the U of T plastics team, as well as the large number of PIs that are involved in this project. We have just a short clip from Dr. Michael Rennie, uh, one of our leading researchers on the project to explain what we are doing and why. To truly understand plastic pollution and tackle it successfully, we need to know more, especially about their impact on freshwater lakes. Plastics are everywhere, and you can probably see why. They're durable, relatively inexpensive, and versatile. But in Canada, we only recycle 10% of our plastics, creating 3 million tons of waste every year, some of which breaks down and ends up in our freshwater lakes. That's our water supply. We already know that in aquatic systems, organisms can swallow plastics, which may lead to reproductive issues, behavioral changes, and even starvation. But to truly understand plastic pollution and tackle it successfully, we need to know more, especially about their impact on freshwater lakes. That's why at IISD Experimental Lakes Area, we're conducting experiments, safely adding microplastics to lake ecosystems and seeing what happens to the lake and the food web it supports, from algae to fish. Once we know more, we can work directly with governments and industry to develop policies that will protect our fresh water from plastic pollution. I love that video. And Did seeing Mike speak with snow in the background makes me really happy it's summer. So I'm not sure how many of you know this, but the Experimental Lakes Area is part of a larger independent policy focused think tank, the International Institute for Sustainable Development. This means that the scientific findings we discover can be directly converted into freshwater policy to have an impact on people's lives. Alice Tipping from our Geneva office explains how our work contributed to her incredible efforts in fishery subsidies and plastic policies. Hello and congratulations IISD ELA on your 54th summer season. My name's Alice Tipping and this is my note from the field. My field, as it happens, is here, Lake Geneva, one of Europe's largest freshwater lakes. But the interesting thing is, I lead work on IISD's trade policy. What does trade policy have to do with freshwater lakes, you might add? As it happens, this freshwater lake laps almost exactly on the steps of this august institution, the World Trade Organization, based here in Geneva. I spend a lot of work and a lot of time at the World Trade Organization and in fact freshwater lake science and trade policy are linked in more ways than you might think. Firstly, here at the WTO members are negotiating an agreement that would require them to consider the status of fish stocks when they decide to subsidize the fishing of those stocks, so that's an important one. Secondly, members are also thinking about how to ensure that their trade policy contributes to the elimination or the reduction at least of plastic pollution, including in particular with respect to pollution caused by microplastics. So there's a lot of collaboration possible. There's a lot of work going on here that's very relevant and that draws very much on the kinds of science that my colleagues at ISD's ELA work so hard on. So powered by my very favorite Swiss chocolate bar, I'm looking forward to another year of very good collaboration. Congratulations again to IISD's ELA on your 54th summer season and regards from Geneva. Thanks so much, Alice. I want to add that last week, WTO members agreed on a new treaty to reduce harmful fisheries, fishery subsidies. So all of the amazing hard work that Alice and her team have been doing has really paid off. So a huge, huge congratulations to the whole team on that amazing work and support to the process. Next, let's go to Emily Croft, who's gonna explain what our education outreach team has planned for the summer. The education outreach team has lots of exciting activities happening this season. For the first time in three years, we are able to offer our in-person ELSE field course for high school students this summer. We are so excited to have them on site. We also have off-site activities planned for kids attending summer day camp in both Winnipeg and Kenora to help everyone learn more about fresh water. 
Our eDNA program made possible by the generous donations of Wawanisa and the Graham C. Lount Family Foundation for high school students provides students facing barriers an opportunity to engage with scientific fieldwork and lab work launched this school year and will now be occurring annually under the mentorship of the Docker Lab at U of M. We also launched our new youth engagement program for youth aged 18 to 30 this past year. This program brought workshops on topics and sustainability to over 200 students and young people, and we were fortunate to plan joint programming with four incredible youth-led climate organizations. This program will be continuing in the coming year as well. The Seguin Community Dialogue about Environment and Health has also been a highlight for our team. This project discusses four important themes related to freshwater and community engagement, providing an opportunity for both science and Indigenous communities to share and exchange knowledge and learn from one another. Thanks so much, Emily. Uh, I just want to say a huge shout out to all the students we've worked with this year and will continue to work with over the summer. You inspire us to do what we do and you make us communicate the science that happens at ELA in a clear way. And I just cannot say my thanks. I'm not sure if we have any students or teachers on the line, but thank you very much for caring and for being involved and, and helping us you know, communicate better. Hopefully many of you know about the work that we've been doing at the African Center for Aquatic Research and Education to bolster the role of African women in science. This involves allowing women in Africa working on freshwater issues to meet their peers on the North American Great Lakes, share ideas and build up their networks. One of those women, Donata Alupad, is currently studying in Algeria and this is a special message for us. Congratulations, IISDELA, on your 54th summer season. Welcome to Algeria. My name is Donata Alupot. I'm a meteorologist and currently doing my master's in Algeria. I talk about climate change and offer ideas on how we can simplify communication of science in communities to increase participation in our research. My relationship with IISDELA is through ACARE under the African Women in Science 2022 program. I'm excited about IISDELA because as a young female scientist, I look forward to working with them on projects that include the impacts of climate change to communities and also offer solutions on how we can improve resilience and also increase adaptability altogether to reach sustainability. So this is a delicacy in Algeria and I'm drinking the mint tea. So as we celebrate the 54th summer season, cheers. Hey. Thanks so much, Donata. I love mint tea as well. It's making me want a cup right now. Um, we're also really proud of this video that we developed to tell the story of the African Great Lakes, why they matter and the women who work on them. So let's take a quick look at that as well. What are the African Great Lakes? Did you know that in East Africa, there's a group of seven lakes that are so extraordinary, they're called the African Great Lakes. What makes them so great? Lake Albert, Lake Edward, Lake Kivu, Lake Tanganyika, Lake Malawi, Nyasa, Nyasa, Lake Turkana, and Lake Victoria span 10 countries, constitute over 25% of the Earth's fresh water, and are critical to the livelihoods of over 62 million people. That's because these lakes provide food, clean water, and secure jobs for all of the surrounding communities. And they're super important when it comes to supporting biodiversity in the region. Unfortunately, they're in trouble. Everything from climate change to pollution and invasive plants and animals are threatening the health and future of Africa's Great Lakes, with serious consequences for the tens of millions of people who depend on them, particularly women. Sound familiar? That's because lakes across the world, including North America's Great Lakes, are suffering from many of the same ailments thousands of kilometers apart. Seems like we all need to put our heads together and come up with common solutions. I care, you care, A care. That's why the African Center for Aquatic Research and Education, or ACARE, is bringing together hundreds of scientists from across Africa and internationally 
to share knowledge, learn from each other, and research Africa's Great Lakes. We're working with Canada's IISD Experimental Lakes Area to help us understand the impacts of everything from harmful algal blooms from Lake Michigan to Lake Malawi on our fresh water. And through our African Women in Science program, we're proud to be championing the voices and careers of African women in science so they can tackle these issues head on. My name is Cecilia Mataba. I am a researcher scientist at Tanzania Fisheries Research Institute, currently working on the Lake Victoria. Uh, for the future of our Great Lakes, I think women scientists play a great role of conducting a lot of researches on the status of our lake and providing education to the riparian community on how to conserve the lake's environment and how to utilize the lake resources sustainably. Thank you. All this pooled knowledge and work helps us build the best freshwater solutions to benefit the most people, Africans, Canadians, and millions of others across the globe. For more information on how you can help, visit agl-acare.org or iisd.org slash water. I love that video. It's one of a series that we've done that are animated in, in a similar way, explaining our work and our research. Um, I, I would encourage all of you to look at it. And actually in the last couple of years, we've translated two of them into Ojibwe or Anishinaabe. Uh, and done some language guides for those videos. So if you have anyone who's interested in Ojibwe language or Anishinaabe, check those out as well. They were the voice that was done, the voiceover in Anishinaabe was done by a grade 10 student from Fort Francis, um, who's amazing. So check those out. Um, so now we've been speaking about the great place in question for the whole hour, but let's try and head to the site itself and see if we connect, can connect to the fine folks who are currently working there. I will give you a heads up that our annual wine and cheese party at ELA was last night, so they may be a little tired. Um, I'm not sure how many of years we've been holding this annual event, and if there's any alumni on the, on the call, I'd love to hear your thoughts on when the wine and cheese started. Um, but it's an event where everyone puts away their boots and their life jackets and dons their fanciest outfits and comes for a night of celebration. It's usually held in early June to celebrate a successful spring. Um, and yeah, it's definitely a very important part of, of ELA tradition. So this is a picture from last night. Lots of beautiful folks out there. You guys look so great. We held the wine and cheese this year in two new geodesic domes uh, that we built just this spring, madly before uh, a field course started in late May. And uh, I, I'm curious to hear how the dance, how they made out of the dance floor. Uh, is, can we see if anyone, uh, Roger, are you there at, at Hungry Hall? Yes, we are. Can you turn your video you on? Oh, there you oh. are. Yeah, we can hear you, okay. we can hear you. So, woohoo! Hi guys. Oh, it looks so great. How many people do you have on site right now? Uh, 49. Wow. Um, and what's it like being back to sort of busy, busy as usual, bustling? It's good. It's all business out here, Pauline. <laughs> how is the wine and cheese? How are how is the dance floor in the geodesic domes? The only thing hotter than the, than the dome itself was the dancing. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I can imagine. What's the temperature like right now? It's not bad. It's a little. It's a little bit humid today. Yeah, nice. Thanks, you guys. Thanks for joining. So nice to see everybody. I wish I was out there with you. Have a great afternoon uh, out at ELA. Okay, we have a little bit of time left. Um, if you have questions, please put them in the chat. I'm gonna uh, go back over to Vince. Uh, to see what he has to say. So Vince, can you see the chat? Do you want me to read them out? Uh, no, I can see it. I answered the one question. Uh, Peru had a great question. And that was, you know, how confident are we in the eDNA detections when we just have a water sample? Well, this is one of the reasons why we've tested uh, this technique and why it has been tested out at the Experimental Lakes area is, you know, all that 50 years of, of looking at our fish uh, populations that the fish crew has has done, all that work that we've done in our lakes, 
has afforded us a really good background data set. And so to answer some of those fundamental questions about, you know, how accurately can you detect whether or not a fish is there just by taking a water sample, we can verify it against the historical records that our fish crew has taken. Now, in order to do that, you have to have a library of sequences, uh, of DNA sequences for fish. Uh, and that's actually work that's being uh, done by a group called GenFish, uh, headed by Margaret Docker from the University of Manitoba and Daniel Heath at Windsor University. Uh, they're cataloging all the different species across Canada. And so because of that library, we're very confident in our ability to be able to see those fish when we take a water sample. And we're actually moving to the point now of being able to detect how many fish are in a given water body and even what genes they're expressing. So functional gene expression, for example, fish that are exposed to uh, contaminants of, the, of a given kind, whether it's metals from a metal mine or oil from an oil spill uh, or, or excess nutrients or increased uh, temperature, for example, with climate change. So these tools will become very, very powerful. And the best part of these tools is they're minimally invasive. We don't have to you know, handle the fish at all to be able to see that that uh, is having an impact in the system or if and when an impact is, is occurring, what the recovery is like afterwards. They're really powerful tools that we can use now because of the, the advances in genetics. That's so cool. We did this pilot eDNA uh, field course with students from Winnipeg uh, in collaboration with Margaret Docker's lab this summer. And it was so interesting, both in terms of inspiring kids to see what a university lab is like, as well as just the idea of using DNA to understand the environment better. Uh, so I have a question from Ray. Is there any indication that PPDQ is a problem in the Red River from Winnipeg runoff? Yeah, good question. I don't know. Uh, I think, you know, in any case where you have a high traffic area and there's a lot of uh, tire tread particles and you have some runoff into a, a, a nearby waterway, that could be a potential issue. I don't know whether anybody has specifically looked in, in the Red River from Winnipeg. I suspect uh, in some cases, especially in urban areas, um, you're, you're going to have the potential for that exposure. I'm thinking about some of the sort of what, close roadways or well-traveled roadways, even in Winnipeg, where you have, uh, you know, a storm water or storm event and a lot of water runs over into the Red, Red River. That could be an issue. So it's definitely worth looking at. Thanks, Ray. I was wondering, Vince, if you could talk a little bit more about some of the findings from the oil research. We're coming to kind of the end of that study and, and there's been quite a few papers and, and work that's come out. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, we're really in the wrap up stages of that study. So the again, the sort of central theme of that was when there's an oil spill in a freshwater environment, uh, is there potential for bacteria to degrade that oil? So we know, for example, in the Gulf of Mexico, there's 600 different seeps of oil, natural seeps uh, that contribute about 2 million barrels a year to the Gulf of Mexico. But that oil generally gets degraded. And it's because the, the bacteria in that area are primed and ready to use that as a food source. But in a pristine area like uh, the Experimental Lakes area and you know, across North America where pipelines may, may go by, if there's a spill, obviously oil companies, spill responders will do their best to clean it up, but it's not possible to remove all of the oil from a given spill site. So when you hear statistics about 95, 90% of oil is removed, those are generally inflated. It's very rare to achieve more than a 40 to 50% removal rate. So there's residual oil that's present in the system. What's the best way to degrade it? And in many cases, it may be that the bacteria stimulating those bacteria uh, might be able to degrade that oil. And so we were looking at First of all, are the bacteria present in the fresh water? The answer to that is yes. We find bacteria that are capable of degrading um, oil in freshwater environments. Are they stimulated when oil becomes uh, available in that environment? The answer to that is a little less certain, um, and it's a community response. Uh, and so we've gone to the next level, and that is sort of, do we have uh, evidence that there is specific degradation of that oil to byproducts. And this is some of the work that's being done by uh, graduate students. So specifically, uh, Madeline, Madeline Stanley is looking at whether or not those compounds are degraded by bacteria uh, into specific other compounds. So that'll be the sort of last piece of evidence for this project to show that, yes, bacteria are capable of removing that. And then it's a matter of sort of 
stimulating those conditions with the right nutrients, with the right conditions, and the engineered floating wetlands that I spoke about earlier might, might be part of that arsenal of responding to an oil, uh, oil spill. Yeah, that's really, really interesting stuff. Um, uh, where can, so Peru Singh has said he'd be happy to see some research papers. Uh, how, what's the best way to share that with him? Uh, the research papers, so I was a little unclear on that. Uh, research papers on the eDNA technique or what I was just speaking about, because it confused me a little bit because you talked about the CAMP program. Uh, so is it oil or the eDNA that you're you're speaking about, Prue? Yeah, it's the eDNA basically. I'm talking about like the, the reason actually, uh, it's uh, it may kind of help uh, in kind of like vast area as well as in sort of like restricted area as well, right? Like uh, there may be some interest actually in restricted area where you can use the water sample and then access actually if there is any fish there around, right? Right, okay, yeah. So one of the most important papers on eDNA that's come out of the Experimental Lakes area right now was, was authored by Joanne Littlefair. And if you uh, leave your contact details in the chat, I can send that paper on to you so that you can have a read through it. It's uh, she looked at a number of different chains of lakes, and these are some of the fundamental questions that were asked at the beginning of the program. So in other words, does eDNA flow from an upstream lake to a downstream lake? Do you get false positives when a, a fish is not necessarily present in that lake because of the flow of the, of the particles of genetic material? Uh, so Joanne did some fundamental work using a series of chains of lakes that have different species in them, and she's able to answer some of those questions. Later on, she was able to actually look at habitat usage. So once a lake stratifies into different thermal regions, do you necessarily get uh, detections of fish throughout all of those layers of water? Or, for example, the cold water species that are in the bottom, the, uh, the hypolimnion of the lake, does that signal uh, stay in the hypolimnium or does it uh, go to the other layers of the lake as well? So that's that's the kind of fundamental work that uh, that Joanne contributed uh, while she was at ELA. And we can we can definitely share that with you. So Vince, one of the projects we didn't talk about at all today is the fish removal experiment that's being led by Ontario M MNRF. Um, I wonder if you could say a few things about that. Yeah, that's a really exciting project. So it's, first of all, it's uh, very ambitious because <laughs> anytime a researcher takes on a project that will probably outlast their careers, that's amazing to me. So this is a 20 to 25 year experiment and it really gets at the crux of how you manage a fish stock. So, you know, we all know about uh, sort of size limits. Um, there are different types of, or different ways of applying those size limits. So you can limit fish so that only fish within a certain slot size are taken, you know, below this size is not acceptable, above this size is not acceptable. You can allow uh, fish to be taken only up to a certain size, so only small ones can be taken, or you can allow the other way, only large ones can be taken. And the question of this study is, by applying those different management strategies, how does that change the genetics of growth amongst that population? So, uh, you know, sort of thinking back to, uh, when you, some folks who are interested in aquaria, for example, there's a sort of old adage that, well, fish will grow to the size of the container. And it sort of applies to some of the stuff that we think about fish stocks as well. If you remove a lot of the large fish uh, from a population, will others sort of move into that? Is, does it affect the genetics of the stock and how they will grow? So this experiment is using removal uh, and removal in certain sizes to study how the genetics of those uh, populations will change. And then actually comparing them by taking eggs and fertilizing those eggs from each of those lakes and then raising them in a common garden experiment to see whether or not they express those different genetic traits um, in the same lake. You know, so you can can you discern ones that have been under a certain uh, type of fishing pressure from each other in a common garden lake when they're raised together. So very, very cool experiment. Um, uh, Dak de Kirko from OMNRF is, is running that study with collaborations from across the pond in Scotland. Uh, um, and of course, some of our, uh, our scientists as well from the fish crew. Thanks. Uh, I think I'll just ask one last question unless others have uh, any, please put them in the chat. So we've seen some pretty huge weather events uh, over the last couple of years. We had the biggest kind of 
precipitation over the winter and then the resulting road washout we've seen. I just wonder, are we seeing that in the long-term record yet? Or what, how, what are, what are, what are, you, what are you thinking about that in the LTER kind of program? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that we've seen is that the uncertainty is is greater in recent years. So you mentioned that we've seen some amazing weather events. Just a few years ago, we saw one of the biggest uh, sort of storms uh, that you know decimated a lot of the trees around uh, around the uh, the property. Yeah, and this. This spring, I think uh, one of our hydrologists or our hydrologist, Ken Sandylands, Paul Fafford, shared some precipitation data with us over the winter. It looked like more than twice the amount of precipitation that we'd seen sort of over the last five years or compared with the last five years and certainly a record in terms of the precipitation. So um, I think, you know, there are, there are folks amongst our scientists, Scott Higgins, Mike Patterson, who are much more capable of, of addressing how, you know the weather events that we're seeing and, and how climate change is affecting those but certainly in our area of the world where the experimental lakes area is we are experiencing more severe weather events and more uh, evidence of climate change than anywhere else thanks vince and thanks thanks very much for sticking around and answering some questions and thank all of you for joining us today uh we are really looking forward to an exciting season i mean we've started it already uh, we're very happy to have this kickoff launch and so glad that all of you could join us um, virtually from around the world. Um, if you'd like to stay up to date on the work that we do at ISDLA, please feel free to give us a follow on social media. Samit's going to put all of our various links into the chat. Um, shout out to Samit, who has an amazing social media voice, very British and sarcastic and funny. Uh, and then, of course, we have amazing pictures that always come from the site. So please follow us on social media. It's definitely worth it. Um, also, we said it before, but none of what you saw today would be possible without our donors and your support. If you're inspired to give, you can lend your support on the, at the world, to the World's Freshwater Laboratory on our website on the donate page. There's a button on the top screen, uh, of the page. Um, and we appreciate every donation, big and small. We also greatly appreciate everyone that helps us in other ways, um, helps spread the word about the unique work that we do at the World's Freshwater Laboratory, the Experimental Lakes area, and tell three of your nearest and dearest friends about two things you learned today. Um, if you can inspire a kid to look at insects in the water, do it, it's super fun. <laughs> Thanks everyone. Have a really great day and a wonderful weekend. Uh, really appreciate all of your support and your time joining us in this event. Have a great weekend and a great year. Bye everyone. Much. Yeah, bye. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much.